it's time for us to check back in with Vernon May Sloan and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. In the summer of 1949, we decided to put water in our house. I guess we were one of the first few people on Caney to do this. Some folks used springs, some dug wells, only the county schools had drilled wells. Even the college got their water from a large tank sitting on top of the hill above the school. We had a real good dug well, still have it, and keep it cleaned out and covered even yet so as to have to use in case of emergency, although we do have two drilled wells with electric pumps. But our first attempt at indoor plumbing was different. High on the hill above our house is a natural water spring. Someone in the past had tried to make an opening to a coal bank. Usually water from a coal seam is sulfury, but not this. It's very clear, sparkling, and good. We hired Ernest Sloan to make a basement from cement around this spring. Then we laid pipes from there into our house. I remember the government was not allowing pipes to be sold for private use. The company Willie worked for let us have them. The man brought them after dark and charged us triple what they should have been. We had to have those pipes buried very deep so the water would not freeze. Our hills are very steep and the ditch was deep enough to not be washed out by rain from runoff. Vansel Sloan and his boys dug this ditch for us. It was this ditch that was to save Vernon's life the second time. But in order to tell my story, I must go back and bring up the rest, like turning the heel when you are knitting a sock. The year before, one of our cows had died, leaving a very young calf. Usually in a case like this, the calf was just killed because it was not worth the trouble and expense to feed one that small. My boys always loved animals, so they wanted to try and raise the calf. When it was still small, they would hold its ears and butt heads with it. Finally, it was too strong. Its strength grew faster than theirs. I honestly don't believe they were cruel, but for some reason, the calf learned to hate children. It would chase them and try to kill them. This wasn't so bad until it became grown. Well, as the men were finishing the ditch for our water line, it ran through the pasture where Blackie was kept, safe behind a high fence. Vernon decided he wanted to go talk with Vansel and the other ditch diggers. They looked and saw Blackie and him at the same time. She was coming with lowered head and running fast straight toward Vernon. He would not have had time to get out of the pasture, and the men were too far away to help. Vansel began to yell, Hurry, Vernon! Get in the ditch and lay down! Scared as he was, he did as he was told. The cow jumped over the ditch where Vernon was with no more damage except kicking dirt in his face. When Willie learned of this, he sold the cow to a neighbor. The neighbor said he thought he could break Blackie from wanting to fight. After a losing battle between the man armed with a pitchfork and the cow, she was taken to the rock house cell. I heard that later she had to be killed when she broke loose from the stockyard when some children passed the pen where she was. Willie Vernon was some older when the third accident happened. I guess he was about seven because we moved from Bunyan in 1950 when he was six. Our new home was built close to the creek and back against the hill. We had no front or backyard at all. In fact, the bridge across the creek to the road was attached to the front porch. The back was so near the hill that once, when we were working in the garden on the hill above, a rock came unlodged and rolled straight through the window and landed on the dining room table, splashing into our dinner. You may think I did not like this home, and you are right, I did not. I hated everything about it. All the time I lived there, I felt as if I was in jail and longed for the day when I could move back to my home on Bunyan, where I now live. I only lived there because it was close to school. There were people who would not have a road built over their land, and my children would have had to walk two miles to school through the creek. Thank God we now have a road, and my grandchildren ride the school bus. So do the grandchildren of the people who had to be forced to give us a road. I'm afraid I've gone off on a tangent again, so back to my story. 
Although we had no front or backyard, there was a small space on each side of the house where the kids could play. The older boys had put up a goal where they could play ball. Time and again, the ball would go into the creek and someone would have to chase after it. They had lost several basketballs this way. I finally got tired and when I bought another one, I told them if they let it float off, it was the last one I intended to buy. Next day, Lossus and Vernon were playing, and sure enough, into the creek went the ball. There had been a rain, and the creek was up to the flood level. Lossus said, You know what Mommy said, Vernon, and before I could stop him, he went in. The waters were over his head and very swift. Milburn ran across the bridge and down the road, meaning to try to get ahead of him. There were some low willows bending over the creek far below the house. Milburn shouted to Vernon, Try to catch hold of those trees and hang on. I don't see how he had the presence of mind to do this or even to hear over the loud noise of the waters. Again, I think it was God's will and answer to my prayer. He held on to the branches and Milburn waded in, also using the tree limbs for support, and got him out. And would you believe it, he had got the ball and had it clutched under one arm. I was just about as scared over Milburn as I was over Vernon because at that time he was just recovering from rheumatic fever and was under doctor's orders to not even get out of bed. I made them both change clothes, put them in bed, and made both some catnip tea and asked the Lord to take care of them. Of course, it did not hurt either. As I tell the story of my family, I think I represent most of the folks on Caney. We were a typical family. On a 100% scale, we would have rated about 80% in regards to wealth. Here in the mountains, there is very little social status rating. People are not judged by their bank account. In our church, we have a millionaire and we have people on welfare. The rich man may dress different, but he is just as friendly and common. In writing, I have tried to use some of the words and expressions that belong only to us, and yet to not use so many that other people with different backgrounds could not understand. I do not like to be called culturally deprived, different, yes, simpler, yes, a fiddle in place of a violin. Why should a man who lies and cheats but knows what spoon or fork to use be counted worth more than an honest, hard-working Christian man that drinks his coffee from a saucer? Our folks are poor, but do not think of themselves as poor. They have a heartiness and a love of fundamental goodness that surpasses understanding, a family closeness found nowhere else. Many have more than we do, but none has better. The outside is slowly coming into the mountains, bringing improvements, but destroying more. Soon our mountain way of life will only be a memory, distorted by the writers who have written only for money. Most that has been written was by outsiders from an outsider's viewpoint. Many of our own have turned traitor and written what they thought people wanted to read or what would sell. I've lived through four wars. I was too young to remember very much about World War I. It did not touch the people on Caney very much. Many of our boys were drafted, it's true, and some did not return. The thought of their buddies being left so far from home hurt. Even in death, our mountain families want to still be together. All I remember is father being away from home. He worked as a planer in a carpenter shop at Wheelwright, making the small shanties furnished by the coal barons for the miners to live in. He always counseled us to be sure and lock the doors, never go anywhere alone, be sure and fasten up the animals. He said he knew there were scouters, boys that had deserted the army or were hiding from the draft. I remember once when he and I were hunting our cow, we came across a campfire in a long handle fry pan. He told me to be sure and not mention it to any of my friends. I can't forget the flu epidemics that followed the war. My father took me with him to help dig so many graves that I still cannot look at yellow dirt without feeling gloomy. Why did he take me with him? I had no mother and my sisters were sick. I don't think the flu hurt me very much. We did not lose any of our immediate family, but a very dear cousin, Henry C. Hughes, and many others died, 19 in all. The Second World War was different. Two of my brother-in-laws were in Europe, and many of my nephews were in active duty. 
Again, none of my close relatives were lost. Several boys, sons, and grandsons of my cousins lost their lives, but this time the government did return their bodies. My husband was exempted from the draft because his job as a bulldozer driver was classed as an essential to the war effort. Here in the mountains where we grew most of our food, the ration was not so bad. We were allowed only two pairs of shoes each year, and that's about as many as we could afford anyway. We learned to adjust to our allowance of coffee and tobacco, but we needed the sugar for canning our fruits. I remember how we used some salt in our apples so as to use less sugar. We could spare only a small amount for jelly and jam. The biggest jolt was when the government confiscated the only truck on Caney. It was our only means of getting in and out of Caney, except to ride the mail truck. Many times we needed to take someone to the doctor at night. A funny thing happened when we went to sign up for our ration cards. With us, off-color words were not used in mixed company. I was taught that the word sex was a four-letter word. Even in all our record books, it's boys or girls, men or women. Even the word female was not used. When I began giving the man at the desk the name and age of each child, the first two he knew were boys by their names. Then I said losses, and he looked up and asked, Sex? Oh boy, you could have knocked me over with a feather. When I did not answer, he thought I did not understand and said, I mean, is it male or female? Oh, I knew what you meant, I replied. I just ain't used to having a word like that thrown at me. A lot different from what television has brought to us now. It was a long, hard struggle, but we all did our part. I mean, almost everyone did. Lard and meat was another thing that became scarce. We raised and killed our hogs. We had always been a people that used a lot of pork and pork grease. To use any other shortening was just to make out. Once during the war years, lard went to a dollar a pound. Some man came to Caney with a truckload of 50-pound wooden tubs of lard, selling them for $30 a tub. I did not buy any. Many of my friends and neighbors did, and when they began to use the lard, they found the tubs had been filled with mashed potatoes with just a little lard on top. When we bought a new tube of toothpaste, we had to return the old empty tube. The government bought up all the scrap, aluminum, and even bacon drippings and table scraps that were meat. There were so many things I would love to tell about those times, but I know old folks would get bored and the younger ones would not believe or understand. In the Korean War, my sons were too young, but I worried and wept with my sisters whose sons fought. Again, none of our close family was killed. Then in the Vietnam War, we were not so lucky. Philip Jacobs, my sister's grandson, was killed. I had only seen him twice in his life. His father had been in the army and was stationed in California, but he was one of mine and I loved him. My sister was never well and I think the news of his death hastened her death. During World War II, my father had an income of $8 a month, old age pension. He supplemented this by whittling hammer and axe handles and repairing chairs. He was still very active for a man past 80. He cut down on his tobacco and coffee so as to have money to buy newspapers and keep up with the war news. I don't pay any attention to news. Oh, I listen, but I don't believe half of what they say. I have heard so much that I knew was lies or half-truths that I question it all. We didn't have a radio then, so it was September the 3rd, 1945, before I knew the war was over. My husband went to work that morning and returned about 10 o'clock. The company had given them the day off to celebrate. I remember I killed two friars and used the last of my sugar to make some half-moon apple pies. There was no one except the family to help me eat, but I had to do something. I was so happy. In January 1959, one of my sons volunteered for the draft. He spent most of his two years in El Paso, Texas. After his eight weeks of boot training at Fort Knox, Kentucky, he got married and took his wife with him. We all visited him once when he was still in Kentucky, and one of his brothers spent a whole summer with him in Texas. It was the first time I had ever stayed away from any of my children, and I don't have to tell you it was very hard. We are, like all mountain people, a very close family. 
As I've said before, there were many folks who will not be remembered for their good deeds, but have the label of bad men. Seems as if every family clan had at least one bad man, but I think many had more fame than their just due. The only one that had any connection with my life was Bad Amos Fugate, or Little Amos as he was called by his friends, and he had many more friends than enemies. The story goes that his sister had a fight with some neighbor woman and the other woman was killed. Amos confessed to the crime to save his sister and was sentenced to prison. Before his sentence was up, he dressed in women's clothes and walked out with some visitors. A price was placed on his head to be brought in, dead or alive. Whenever he saw one of those posters, he would mark out the word alive, saying that he would have to be killed before captured. He was a cousin to my brother-in-law, Sam Fugay, and a very good friend. My sister and their children really loved Amos. They helped him by giving him food while he was hiding from the law. My father was going to visit his daughter, Flora Fugate, as he was going across the hill to Ball, where she then lived. He came upon a group of men sitting by the narrow bridle path. The men were drinking and playing cards. My father said he was upon them before he knew who they were. He said he was really scared when he recognized one of them as Amos Fugate. At first, he considered the idea of turning back, but then thought better of that. The men moved out of the path and let him ride on by. Just as he thought he was getting out of sight and all was well, Amos called and said, Hey, are you kidding I? My father turned back and said, Yes. Amos said, Come back here a minute. Father really got scared then, but he turned his mule around and went back. Did you want a drink of good corn liquor? Sure would, and Amos handed him the bottle. Do you know who I am? Amos asked. Yeah, I think I do, Father said. Well, you are Flora's Paul, so go on and don't tell a living soul you saw us here. And Father promised. That night after supper at Flora's house and after Father had gone to bed, Amos came to the door. Sam let him in and gave him his supper. Amos asked Flora had my father told them about seeing him, and he laughed when she said no. Well, I didn't mean for him not to tell you, but I guess when I said to not tell no one, he sure meant to keep his promise. A few days later, Amos was coming back to visit Sam again, and some men laywayed him and riddled his body with bullets from a machine gun. His own folks kept the killers from getting his body when they guarded his grave for one year, keeping a lighted lantern setting on his tombstone at night with a round-the-clock guard. The bounty hunters received no reward. The next story I'm going to tell is true also, but I will change the names. One of the men is dead. The other gave me permission to tell the story and use his name, but I think it's better not to. Bill was a nice enough fellow, young with a few wild oats to sow. His girlfriend was staying at the community center, and Mrs. Lloyd had very strict rules about letting girls and boys have dates. He only got to see her once in a while. Meantimes, he would spend his weekends by visiting a place on Long Fork, also a made-up name, where they made and sold whiskey and the home of some good-looking girls. One day, Mr. Long's brother shot Bill. It was supposed to have been an accident, but the Longs paid all the doctor bills, and just as soon as Bill got so he could walk without his crutches, he went back again. He said he wasn't mad and did not carry a grudge, but I guess they did not believe him because this time one of the Long cousins, Roy, beat him almost to death. It was days before Bill could even see to walk, but this time he was really mad. He went and bought him a gun, and knowing where Roy Long went across the hill to his WPA job, he lay weighed him with the intention of killing him. Somehow, Roy got word and went home by a different route. That night, Roy packed his furniture, and taking his wife and children, he moved to West Virginia. Only his kinfolks knew where. Twenty years passed before Roy and Bill were to meet again. By this time, Bill had married and settled down. He had a job at Prestonsburg, and each weekend he rode the bus from there to Whalen. This Friday, the bus was full, only one empty place in the seat where Bill was when the bus stopped at Allen to pick up a passenger. Though time had changed him, Bill knew Roy as soon as he come on board. 
but Roy did not recognize Bill until he was almost ready to sit down beside him. His face turned a deadly white, and he almost turned to run when Bill said, Hello, Roy. Please, Bill, Roy began. I know you should hate me, but believe me, I've been punished a lot having to stay away from my folks, never hearing from them all this time. I just had to come back. I would not blame you if you beat me up, but I don't have a gun, not even a knife. Hush, I don't want to hurt you. I forgave you a long time ago. Come sit down here and let's talk about old times. I'm a different man now. I don't want to hurt you. So they finished the bus ride laughing and talking. Bill did not know until a few weeks ago that my father was responsible for getting word to Roy that Bill had bought a gun and was laywaying him, thus probably saving us from having another bad man. I don't think any of our bad men really started out to be bad. They usually were kind and gentle, loved by their folks. Something just happened and one thing led to another and people expected them to be bad. Many had folk songs written about them, thus causing their fame to grow and be remembered. You may think after reading this that I approve of bad men. Far from that. I don't like any wrongdoing, but they were just a part of our past, and I want to give a true picture of mountain life. Also, I think there was not as many of these bad men as I've been told about, and those few were credited with more bad deeds than they really had done. But it's all true that their family and friends looked up to them and helped in every way they could to protect and hide them from the law. If one man turned another man in, whether wanted for moonshining or murder, he most always had a grudge against him and did it for spite and not for the reward or civic duty. The tattletale was thought of as a lesser man by his neighbors than the lawbreaker. Huh. Another interesting little peek into Verna Mae Sloan's life there. Uh, all of it interesting. Fascinating, really, when you think about the differences in the culture from then till now. So mesmerizing and fascinating to think about. I like the very beginning when she's talking about the water, how they were uh, dug the ditch and had water come off from the coal seam. When I was young, Granny and Pap had gravity water, which come from a spring up the creek, until I was in eighth grade, and that's that's when, in eighth grade, I was in about eighth grade, Pap decided he would have a well drilled. Well, why did he not have a well drilled to begin with? Well, it's expensive, even in those days, even more so today. But also, spring water was what Pap had grew up on, and he knew how good it was. He knew it was wonderful, has such a great taste. The downside to having spring water like that, gravity-fed spring water, uh, which is like Verna May kind of talked about, they dug a big ditch. There was, Pap dug a ditch and buried the line where he could, but between here and the spring that he used, there were some places that you would just, you'd had to have like dynamite to dig a ditch. So the pipe just had to lay on top of the ground. And um, didn't, not so much in Verna May, she didn't mention this, but of course for us, for Pap, the big downside was that in summer, it didn't matter a bit that that pipe was laying on the ground. And most of the time in the winter, it would be okay because we would, he would, before he went to bed at night, he would leave a little trickle of water running in the kitchen and maybe one in the bathroom um, or maybe just one in one place, but sometimes in both. But on really, really bitter cold, bitter cold, like the cold that we had this, this year at Christmas that froze so many people's water, and it was not gravity water, you know, that got froze in our area. It was people with well houses and pumps and all that. But when those kind of winters come, it would freeze. Well, once it's frozen, you know, if you think about the long stretch of pipe, you just have to, he'd just have to go along and kind of uncouple it in places and, and build fires and try to unthaw it and then uncouple it and blow out the ice to, to leave room for the fresh water to come. So I'm sure it, that did get old. Now, me and Paul, we thought that was big fun. We got to go with him to, to do all that and, you know, it'd be cold outside, but we'd be playing in the fire and we thought those, the frozen parts that come out of the pipe was like popsicles so that was always fun but i'm sure for pap it got got old and so that was the well was really a 
you know, an attractive thought to have a well drilled. He was really worried though. I remember him being paranoid kind of about it and just fretting over it once the, it, you know, the day was gonna be and they were gonna come drill the well, was whether or not that water would be as good as the spring water. He was worried that what if it's not as good and you spent all this money, but thankfully it was. It was really good water, really good well water. Matt and I have really good well water too. We're very lucky in that. So in the old days, of course, using uh, whether it was hand dug wells, kind of like Verna May say, and the one they still have that they keep covered, or uh, just using spring water from a spring or gravity fed spring water like Pap and Granny did, that was, I mean, beyond common. That's what everybody did. I remember my mama and papa's house, which was the kind of the first one when you come up into Wilson Holler, it's no longer there. But in the woods behind their house, they had a big kind of reminded me, she said they, he built like a basement wall to the man that was helping them catch their water and then was gonna feed it into the house. So it was kind of like that. It was a big concrete cistern that was up there and it, the water flowed into it and then went on down to the house. Much closer though than the spring that fed Granny and Pap's house. So, so many various ways in the past that people figured out how to utilize water and then as time went on, figured out how to make it easier, put it inside their house or at least get the well in their yard so you just had to go out to the yard and dip out the water. Sort of crazy when she's talking about the cow, the main cow. Uh, maybe it was just a crazy cow, but you got to wonder if all the, the little kids buttoning it in the head is what made it hate kids, you know. It's, maybe they were buttoning it too hard or maybe they were aggravating it or making it frustrated. So I kind of wonder, I'm like, well, it could have just been a mean cow, but, but if they were continuously holding its ears and buttoning it in its head, no wonder it didn't like little kids. But um, scary though, I mean, when a cow, a big cow, if it decides to come after you, it's not, that's a pretty intimidating thing. It'd be one thing if it was a little calf, you know, the size of a dog or something, but, but when you think about a full-size cow, but I gotta wonder if they didn't, if the cow didn't not like children because the children teased it too much. And all those different ways that her son almost got hurt, you know, then the last part, last week that we read it was that she carried him um, when her husband's mother died. They went in the snow and he got too cold. And, and then these are the ones that she shared in this part of the uh, book. Just goodness, thank goodness he was okay. She was right. God was just watching out for him. All those different things, ways, different ways that he could have got hurt. Now the part about the ball rolling off into the creek we don't have that issue here but i i mean it's lots of kids when i read that i thought lots of kids in the mountains of appalachia and probably in other mountains too but can identify with that even if it's not rolling off into a creek like in her situation just rolling off the hill and you got to go get it and rolling off the hill and you got to go get it i thought i wonder how many kids have had uh, basketball goals in their backyard and then they have to chase the ball you know or even if it's a if you're just throwing throwing a ball or kicking a ball around or something, there's always a bank it can go off, it seems like, when you live in the mountains. I like the part where she was talking about the, you know, in her church, there was the millionaire, and then there was people on welfare. Um, she, I like the point of what she was making, though, that it was just, they were all just community. It didn't matter. The social status there didn't matter. But I did like, you know, it is lots of different people, but uh, I can only, I'm like Verna May, I can only talk about my people, uh, the Appalachian people, a lot of times are thought to be uncouth or unmannerly or whatever, whether it's the way they speak or like she was talking about uh, pouring coffee in their saucer, saucer and blowing their coffee, their hot coffee or their tea, and how, um, or maybe they'd go to a restaurant and, and you know, you're sitting down there and there's like two spoons and two four, you know, and you don't know which to use. And, and people would be like, oh, you know, some people would like, oh, you're so unmannerly. You just don't know. But I like her point she was making. She was like, and she wasn't saying all rich people were bad at all, uh, but she was just saying, so you think they're unmannerly, yet the person that lies and cheats and steals, but he knows which spoon to use, he's, he's better than the person that don't know which spoon to use and slurps his coffee out of the saucer, but yet he's honest. So um, I like that part. I mean, that's just human nature, though, that don't even necessarily have to be in the mountains of Appalachia anywhere. That's human nature that somehow um, people who are wealthy seem to, we, we look at them like they're better somehow, they're smarter, they're whatever. It's just society does. I don't necessarily do that myself, but, but it's just kind of that air that happens. It has, that's been going on since the beginning of time. 
but it is interesting to think about. She made a good, uh, good point there. What's what difference does it make? I mean, which do you would you rather know how to use the right spoon and not slurp your coffee, or be honest and decent and kind? It's interesting to hear her talking about the different wars and how it affected her, uh, infected her family. I've not heard that many. You know, you think of the Roman bands of kind of desperados or bad men, to use Verna May's term. Most of the time you hear those, it's like during the Civil War, you heard about bands of people like that. So it's interesting, in World War I, she says there was also people in her area like that, and how her daddy had said, keep the doors locked, don't go off by yourself, protect yourself. So that was really fascinating. And then the, the flu epidemic that she's talking about, so many if you if you're somebody like me and you love to go to old graveyards you can if it's a really old graveyard you can usually find find a whole spate of graves that's from from that flu epidemic you can kind of pinpoint the time and especially sadly i've seen in lots of them it will be obviously from the same family and you can tell they died within days apart and you think about how devastating it must have been for that horrible flu to affect them and it hit their whole family and then several of the same family die uh, such a hard time in, in history and of course there's been other plagues and things like that uh, throughout time since the beginning of time but I found that really interesting I have a fascinating interview where um, um, a gentleman local gentleman he's passed away now but he interviewed another local lady Mrs. Anderson and that was she talks about the flu about how her and they just live they were just this way over the ridge there in Pinhook is where where she was born and raised and where she lived when this interview was done, still in her in her house that she grew up in that her family owned. And fascinating to hear her talk about it, how she remembered, and you would, something like that would imprint how her poppy, she calls him instead of daddy, poppy had went to deliver some stuff and come back and started feeling bad. She goes through the whole process of how they were all sick and um, the whole family and how neighbors come in and took care of them. Really heartwarming. I'll link to that in the description below in case you'd like to go hear it. Another thing or Verna May reminded me of, another older woman in my community, the, if you've seen my videos with Granny Hicks, that part about Verna May was saying that ration book that had two, two pairs of shoes a, a year and mostly you know that's all they could afford anyway i think in one of my recent videos miss hicks talks about that granny hicks but i think she says we couldn't even buy two pairs of shoes you know you were lucky if you got one pair of shoes she's telling about how she has to share um, someone come home from the war and then they didn't have they lost their boots or something i can't remember the exact part of it but anyway she talks about how well that wasn't no problem they shared their ration book with him because they didn't they didn't buy more than a pair of shoes each year so those two two pairs that you could buy most people was not going to actually use both of those and then the ending where verna may's talking about the bad men kind of reminds you of all the um movies and different things that's been made about the Hatfield and the McCoys and all the feuding and all those kind of things. Um, but Verna May gives a, you know, it's nice, the little insight she gives into both the two, the men that she's talking about. And of course she says she don't go along with no, she's not trying to put them up on a pedestal. She's just kind of trying to tell how it is that they were, especially the first one sounds like a bad man, but then also that their family loved them and that they looked out for their family. So um, I guess it's kind of saying two things can be true at once. You can be bad, but then there can be good parts. You know, kind of kind of that outlooks what Verna May was trying to do. But what I thought was really interesting was the one that when they finally did shoot him, they waylaid him. Uh, that, that's an interesting word because some people would say laid, weighed, and then some people would say waylaid. Anyway, I got to get off on the language every time I think about that word. But interesting that once they did kill him, the family got the body, and then they knew that they had killed him because they wanted that reward. And so then they, when they buried him, they, I mean, just think about that for a whole year. Now, that's some stubborn determination right there. For a whole year, they guarded his grave. That's just amazing. They guarded it. They left a lit lantern there so people could see it was being guarded, and they guarded it for an entire year so that nobody could collect the money for killing him. That's pretty amazing. Uh, pretty stubborn and uh, mm, just an amazing thing, though, that that family, that, and that, like she was saying, he was a bad man, he'd done stuff he shouldn't do, but then again, that shows how his family felt about him, that they were going to be determined that nobody was going to profit over a killing him. 
just a fascinating peek into the culture of days gone by here in the Appalachian Mountains. I hope you enjoyed this part. I hope that you'll leave a comment and tell me what you enjoyed. And please drop back by next Friday. I think we've got about two more Fridays with Verna May, and then we'll be starting a new book after that.